The Entrepreneur Unleashed. The Entrepreneur Unleashed. Entrepreneurs Unleashed. The podcast where purpose and passion become revenue streams. Be real. Take a stand. Change lives. Here's your host, Patty Keating. Welcome to the Entrepreneur Unleashed show. I'm your host, Patty Keating. Entrepreneurs everywhere are creating a new breed of business success. They're making their own rules taking a stand for their purpose, leading through integrity, and making money by changing lives. Join me each week for compelling messages that will inspire and empower you to unleash your true purpose. Today's guest is Adam Urbanski, and I am so excited to bring you Adam. He is an amazing man. I have worked with him. He mentored me and coached me in growing my business, and I can't wait to share his story with you because I know you're going to get some golden nuggets today. Adam is a marketing strategist, and he works with coaches, consultants, and service professionals, and really, he's more of a small business change agent in um, a marketing whiz. He trains, he facilitates, he speaks. But above everything else, Adam is passionate. He's a passionate entrepreneur, ideal guest for the show and to share his story with you. I know he immigrated to the United States from Poland, but I'm going to let him tell you a little bit about that. Hi, Adam. Hi, Patty. How are you doing? I'm good. How are you today? I'm fantastic. Super excited to be here. We're, we're so excited to have you. So tell us a little bit about your story and, and your background. I just like totally left it wide open. huh? I did. I'm, I wanted you to do the honor. <laughs> oh, very cool. So as you said, you know, I uh, came to the United States from Poland in 1989. And uh, in less than 10 years, I built a multi-million dollar business in the uh, restaurant industry. We had a chain of coffee shops slash bagel shops. And, you know, I, I think what's, what's really important to highlight here that I started absolutely with nothing. I was a high school graduate. I didn't speak English. I could only say, excuse me, how do you do? And do you have the time? And when someone answered, I had no idea, you know, what they were what they were saying to me. Absolutely, I had no contacts. I had one hundred ninety four dollars when I arrived, and uh, you know, it was just I, I had a huge dream of bettering myself off, and really, you know, from that point, there was nowhere to go but up. And I uh, was really fortunate. I had good mentors. You know, was in the right place at the right time, and just wasn't afraid to work hard. And that's what got me ahead. And then once I sold that business, you know, really, went, my passion has changed. My and and I, I I'm certain we'll probably. Uh, circle back to that. But you know, what drove me has changed. And I really realized that I wanted to impact more people. And, and uh, I knew that running a restaurant business just won't take me there. It, it's not what I wanted to do. So I shifted into uh, business coaching and consulting and have been doing this ever since. I was really fortunate once again, because I got into online business, into really marketing my professional services online, right about uh, the year 2000, right after the uh, dot-com bust, and everybody was running from the internet. But a few smart folks were figuring out how to use it to actually promote services, promote educational programs and products. And, uh, you know, I kind of got fortunate again because uh, it positioned me as a, I often call myself the granddaddy of the uh, marketing online of coaching and consulting services. I was one of the first guys in the coaching consulting industry that really got to test different things online. And uh, because of that, again, uh, very blessed to have amazing as students and clients like yourself and, and just many people who are very visible, very prominent and, and leaders in the you know, online marketing and coaching consulting industry. So that's kind of my story in a nutshell. In the process, I created beautiful, beautiful families. We talked you know, before the show briefly about our kids. You know, mine are um, a junior and sophomore in college. You've got a junior in college. So just two beautiful, amazing girls, athletes, just you know, beautiful, beautiful, beautiful uh, women. And, uh, and what else do you want to know? <laughs> That's awesome. Well, what what inspired you to to start your business? I heard a little bit of that in the description. You know, you wanted you wanted a better life for yourself. Why did you choose business as a way to um, really express that desire? You know, very very good question. And I think that um, I'm trying to think. There's so much that comes to my mind. I'm I'm thinking, how do I share it best in in this interview format and impact you know impact our listeners here. You know, I often tell my, my clients and students, there's nothing that makes me different from anybody else. If anything, I've just figured out how to make a few things work. So I'm a few steps ahead. And the beautiful things that my personal passion is actually sharing, it's, whenever I learn something, I want to turn around and shout to the world, hey, like, come over, do this, do this. 
it's almost like you see kids on the playground when they find something interesting. They're like, call everybody and say, hey, come check it out. <laughs> it's kind of like, you know, that's what really drives me. I want to do that. So I started my first business. Really, it was a fluke, Patty. I, my, my parents own a bakery in Poland. And that's really kind of the only thing I knew. But I also saw how hard they work. And I swore that I never want to do what my dad did. Never, ever, ever. And well, guess what? Uh, <laughs> coming to the United States as a high school grad, no, not necessarily any skills. Somehow I ended up in the same industry. And I actually loved it for a long, long time. I really did love it. And what drove me initially in that first business was I simply wanted to better myself off. I wanted to economically provide for myself. I wanted to have a big house on the hill, drive fancy cars. When you are looking at $194 in your, as your entire possession, in fact, you know, I had uh, people who, who uh, well, kind of took me under the wings. And, and only later on, they, they told me that they checked my shoes and I had holes in the shoes. And, you know, so it's like, you know, that's from, you know, if you've ever lived in New York, there's lots of walking. Shoes are wearing off very fast. And, uh, you know, I didn't have much. So that's what drove me first. I just was hungry for more. And why business? Because one of the reasons I left Poland is because I was facing a mandatory military draft in Poland back then. Uh, everybody had to go into military for three years. And uh, that, it, and it was, you know, Polish military was pretty much like Soviet military. So something I wasn't looking forward to. I'm just not very good with authority. And <laughs> it's not that I don't take orders well. It's just that I question things. Yes. I constantly want to reinvent things. When I see something done, I immediately see at least a dozen ways to do it better. And it, unfortunately, in, in any industry, you know, that, that's being disruptive. Today, people pay premium for being disruptive like this. You know, yes. People seek, seek out employees. Companies seek out employees who have that ability. Well, you know, 20 years ago, 25 years ago, that was just being seen as an, seen as an oddball and, and you were pretty much cast out. Not, not many people wanted to have you around because the minute they brought you around, you pretty much broke whatever was working. Now, the breaking it might have ended up making it working better in the future. But in the moment, you know, I was just very disruptive. And the second thing, once I sold my restaurant business, again, very blessed to build a very successful multi-seven-figure business, sold it and... Uh, and wanted to, my, my passion has really shifted. What I discovered, what drove me the most in my restaurant business was really working with people. Like I considered my employees to be my clients and my students. You know, I was their coach and the mentor often. You know, the young kids who came to work with me, that was, that was like the first or second job. And, you know, I was at the place where I was able to impact them for the rest of their life, showing them how to be more successful, even when they work for somebody else, how to really start thinking differently, behaving differently and better themselves off. And, you know, I was like a shrink for my clients. We ran a fast food restaurant and all my employees were trained. That we were, I've always joked that we had a fast food restaurant, but we had a white tablecloth uh, mm. service. And, you know, people didn't come for coffee. They didn't come for bagels and muffins and lunches and dinners. They came for an experience and to share about the day. So my job in the restaurant was to walk around and schmooze with customers and just really get to know. It's like, hey, why are you here? What's your day like? What's your story? And people just loved it. They felt heard. So that was my next passion, really transforming lives. And, uh, you know, one day I was in a workshop when I first started my coaching consulting business. And I wrote this vision for myself to uh, eradicate entrepreneurial or small business failure worldwide. And that's kind of what drives me. I'm transforming lives one at a time. As a company, our mission is to awaken people to the possibilities to creating highly successful businesses. And that's just what drives me every morning. Money is fantastic. But when people tell me, look, you saved my marriage, you saved my business, I hired two new people, I bought a bunch of new equipment, I went on a cruise of a lifetime and swam with the dolphins. That's just like, that's life transformed forever. That's what really drives me today. Yes, that's amazing. So on this journey of yours, what major obstacles showed up? <laughs> you know, what I love about you, Penny, it's like you ask the question like so nonchalant. It's like, what, 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 you, you know, what makes, it's like, really? Have you ever built a business? Where do I start? I don't know that I know there. I hear this from everyone and I've experienced it. You just bump right into them. It's like, you know, what, what wasn't an obstacle? <laughs> Anybody thinks that it's like, you know, you say, hey, I'm going to open a business. And then it's like, dum -da -da, red carpet <laughs> rolling out and fun first and, you know, and, and the greeting committee is just everybody's like, wow, how can we make your life better? Not <laughs> at all. I mean, pretty much everything. I always say, again, to clients and students, look, whenever you decide to do something, you can pretty much bet that the universe has already decided to test you how badly you really want it. It's yes. like the moment you say, I want to do this, the universe, ah, we'll see about that. 
Yeah. And pretty much every curveball you can imagine is going to be thrown your way. But when I thought about it, I really think that one biggest thing I want to, I want to, bottom line is, um, see, I'm rambling because it's so, I want to cram so much information. Here. <laughs> take your you know, time. Take your time. I'm always teaching people that whatever has gotten you here obviously won't get you to the next step. And it's so important for entrepreneurs. So I think when I started my business, I was just hungry. I didn't know what I didn't know. And then obviously you start learning things that, hey, the technical skill of doing something. So I started the restaurant business because I knew how to, you know, bake something. But, you know, knowing how to bake something is totally different skill than knowing how to open and run a restaurant and how to hire people and how to run your accounting and how to have a vision for growth and how to go from one location to two, from two to three, and how to have, you know, multiple locations and production plans and how to, how to run your team so they can function independently of you. I mean, every single one of those things, they don't just appear in your head out of the blue. You have to think about it. You have to seek resources. You have to seek educations, mentors, and coaches. But I think what's really appropriate for our audience today, I want to talk about my the biggest obstacle when I shifted from restaurant business to a coaching consulting business was really selling myself. It was so easy to go out and get catering deals, you know, or wholesale accounts in the restaurant business. It's easy. I mean, I'm selling products. It's tangible stuff. And it really messed with my head when I switched to selling my services because ultimately I was just selling myself. And grant you, I had a, you know, I was 29 years old, just sold a multi-million dollar business, very successful. But you know, still back, if you think about it, today it's acceptable for young people to be much more successful. Back then, an image of consultant was a guy in his mid-50s, you know, pepper hair, you know, three-piece suit, and I was just this little young <laughs> buck. Totally didn't fit. So it it was a challenge. And the first thing I did to overcome it, I actually hired a coach. I hired a sales coach. And uh, and it helped, but you know, it's and today I teach coaching, I teach selling, and, and I have you know a very unique methodology of what I do and how I do it. But it took years to develop it, and then I look back, there's a few things that happened. So when I worked with my first coach, he gave me uh, really good technical skills. He kind of walked me, just like, look, hey, here's the selling process, and here's what you got to do. But you know, it was really old school selling, very scriptive, you know, very mechanical. So I call it the technology of selling. It gave me the skills, but it really, I still didn't have the confidence. I still didn't quite know how to ask for big dollar amounts. I still didn't quite know how to elicit value in, in what I could offer or what, what, what I do could help other people accomplish. So that's the technology. I call it the psychology. So people often get so focused on the technology of doing everything that they forget that technology is just the 10 parts, the scripts, the language, the words, they're important. But ultimately, it's the psychology, it's really the confidence, uh, it's really being clear why you're doing what you are doing. And you know that took a lot longer to create and to develop, and ultimately, it comes from practice. You know, you can, people often talk, you talk about you can't write, you can't learn how to ride a bicycle reading a book, but it's the same thing in business. And um, you know, I know, Patty, you encounter the same thing working with your students and clients, when, you, when someone is asking over and over and over, how do I do it, how do I do it, how do I do it, it's like you just go and do it. Yes. And when you do it, you're, gonna get, you're going to get so much more learning in just you know, a short amount of time than you could have gotten from books and seminars and anywhere else for, for months and years. You just, there, is a, there is a tipping point beyond which education will do you nothing. You just have to go and do it. And the same thing with selling. And so many people are afraid to misunderstand what it is. And you simply have to just start having, you know, caring conversations. If nothing else, you know, just show up and, and, and inquire, like, what, what are people looking for? What's the biggest problem? What solution would serve them? And when you just show up and inquire without any agenda, you just might end up selling a boatload more without even, without even knowing how the hell you sold. <laughs> exactly. So, you know, that's kind of a long answer to the obstacles. But yeah, obstacles will show up. There'll be plenty of them. And I think for most entrepreneurs, it's again, understanding that every single day they're going to encounter new challenges. So this ability to constantly learn new things and marketing and selling are the two, two uh, you know, it's, it's a two, two part engine of your business. And if you don't get that figured out and figured out quickly, you know, your boat will not float. There's just your car will not go. You have to get that engine working. So would you say that's the lesson you learned that there's always going to be an obstacle in and how to move through them? Huh. Probably. You know, there's just so many lessons that I've learned. Um, I probably have a bunch of different ones, but that's definitely one of them. 
Give us another one. What's coming to mind? The first restaurant that I opened as a consultant for someone else, I actually ended up managing that restaurant after it was open. And uh, we had a uh, service that would come in once in a while and kind of, you know, clean up, buff up the floors and really just kind of do a great job of polishing our tiles. So I stayed after hours and, and let the vendor in. And, um, you know, I was, again, I was like in my early 20s. And this guy is doing the work and he's like, it's the owner of the company. And, uh, you know, I'm just kind of sitting down the bar stool and, and having a chat as he's working. And, uh, you know, at one point he kind of looked and said, you know, you're going to go very far in life. And it kind of took me aback. I'm like, well, why do you say that? And he said, you know, because you're smart enough to ask questions and then shut up and listen. And, you know, it really stayed, it, it really wasn't a business advice, but, you know, he told me, he, he basically, he, he highlighted a skill, which is being curious. And then when people tell you, actually, don't just, you know, don't argue, don't question, don't, you know, just really, just really listen and ponder. So that was a huge, huge lesson for me. But there was another lesson which escaped me for many years. And I had a, um, in one of my restaurants, I had a, I had a client named Russell. And uh, Russell, I, to this day, I really don't know what the hell Russell did. You know, <laughs> I just know that he was uh, wealthy as heck. Every car, he, every, every week he drove a new, brand new car, you know, super fancy cars. And, uh, you know, so I've always, and he always ordered the same thing. We knew him well. And, and one day I struck up a conversation. I had many, but this one particular day always stands out in my head. And, and, I, and he said, Russell said, you know, so you want to know how to get ahead in life? I'm like, well, who doesn't? And he said, look, there, there are two things. Number one is uh, you've got to find something that people want. You've got to find a problem and solve it. Kind of in a nutshell, that's what he said. And I'm like, yeah, 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 great. I've heard that before. Read it in the books, right? Already by then. It's like if you want to get rich, you know, find out what people are buying and sell it to them. It's like, great, I get that. But he said, if you really want to get like filthy rich, you have to create a market and control it. And I was like, yeah, great, Russell, great advice. I'm going to start on that right away. <laughs> I, I had no idea what it I mean. Create a market and control it. Like what? You're like, what, build your own country? What the hell is this, <laughs> right? I, I was clueless. But you know what hit me? After about two or three years in the, in the coaching consulting business, because I built a uh, database of subscribers. And, you know, just I realized that I had a market and with a flick of a button, I controlled that market. And that's really the power that, um, that, you know, a lot of us have today. So the biggest advice, the biggest lesson would really be create your own market. And that in our terminology simply means if you're not building a following, if you're not building a list, if you're not building a platform, whatever you want to call it, and you're not actively finding ways to add people to your database of, you know, current, past and future subscribers and customers, you are you doing yourself and your business a huge disservice, a huge disservice. And just one quick story on this. I have a uh, coaching student that's been with me for a while and, you know, just could, you know, was doing well. He had another business, but he wanted to transition into this more of an education, coaching, consulting business. And he just wasn't building the list, wasn't building the list. And finally, he created a little product and he went out there to offer it. And he came back and said, you know, it just hit me like a ton of bricks. Because I now have a product, I put it out there, and there was no, no buyers. And he said, that moment, it hit me what it meant to build a list. Had I started building a list earlier, I would have had a market to go to and sell my new product. And this way, it's like an uphill battle because I've got to go and chase people to sell it versus I could have had a built-in audience. So just build your audience, build your platform, build your list. That's really the biggest lesson. Without it, again, it's, there's no business. And you live that. You've really taken that lesson to heart and done a fantastic job of building your audience. Well, to the point where, you know, I often joke now that, that in, today we, we, we were again having, you know, kind of a branded website. But there were about five, six years period between like 2007 and eight to 2013 where, you know, we've done millions of dollars of, of uh, business on the Internet and I had no website. Not a website in a traditional sense where people kind of go and, you know, there's about me page and our philosophy and here's what we do and all the products. We had basically one or two page websites, an opt-in page or a sales page. And that's really it. So I constantly focused on just building my database and making offers because that's what grows business. So Adam, tell us what you're passionate about right now. That leads us to here and now. What's up with you? 
Man, what am I passionate about right now? It's it's still the same thing, transforming lives. But you know what really um, drives me today is this idea of um, creating your own playground. And uh, you know it's interesting because when I started talking about it with my friends and, and advisors, they kind of went like, "Yeah, you're crazy. This doesn't really mean anything. There's not even the word business in there. What do you mean, create your own <laughs> playground?" And as I started toy- toying with it and playing with it, I started noticing more people talk about this and you know where the idea came from is very early in the business I realized that business is a game and it's it, the game is rigged against you unless you figure out that there are really are only very few hard rules and every other rule is negotiable and uh, modifiable so the way to win in business you have to introduce your own rules and play the game by your own rules so from that, what came from me when people were talking about, you know, not being able to do something because something outside or the customers control them, I said, look, it's your sandbox. You get to do whatever you want to do. And then one time, um, somewhere early in, the, in, in, my, in my consulting business, somebody says, well, you know, I don't like the sandbox. I want to have a, have a whole playground. I'm like, duh. Yeah, I mean, if you can have a sandbox, why not just have a whole <laughs> playground, right? So then the concept became of, of creating your own playground and really creating your, own, your rules, playing by your own rules, only allowing people that you want to really play with. And, you know, business is such a hard thing to build. It takes years and people are risking their health, their relationships, um, their financial well-being to better off themselves, to provide for the family and the loved ones and make an impact in the world. And I think that somewhere in there, it becomes just a grind. And they forget why they started the business to begin with. And instead of building a playground, they end up building a trap for themselves. It just, you know, they're, 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 they're showing up, the love has disappeared, the passion is gone, and they just find themselves in the daily grind over and over and over and over, frustrated, overwhelmed, confused, working harder, working longer, and not getting ahead. And just the business just stalls. And I think it's really important that we constant, constantly and consciously are aware of the fact that, hey, we started this for a reason. Something drove us. And that has to be the, the guiding light, the guiding thought in our businesses. And when we do it this way, it truly becomes a playground. And as the, our businesses grow to a certain level, when it's done the right way, you know, the entrepreneurs are truly, even though we work hard, we no longer call it work. You know, I think I've, I've heard a program once and someone said, we're not workaholics, we're workaholics. <laughs> and and I, I, that's what I consider myself. You know, we, it, it, it's sometimes we have to find ways to pry ourselves from what we're doing because we are so excited about it. But it has to be done in such a way that it's always enjoyable. It has to be our playground. So, you know, and I see today that, that more and more people are catching on with this idea. So that's really what drives me a whole lot. You know, and another thing is looking for disruptive methodologies. Again, I mentioned earlier, I'm kind of a devil's advocate. And in, our, in the coaching consulting industry, there wasn't, there's any, nothing new in, in, invented or done in, you know, in, in decades. If, if it's like over 100 years. It's pretty much the same industry. You know, the internet came in and added new, um, new technology, new media. The internet really is a new media. That's really it. But in terms of uh, you know, how people are being coached and trained and mentored, it's still the same thing. And you know, I'm kind of thinking that there must be a better way to do it. So I'm constantly on the lookout. You know, what's the way to disrupt the market? That's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> that's, uh, that's how, again, that's, you know, and, and it, it is a great question. I think every single one of us should be asking ourselves this. Because, you know, there is a story of there is uh, two uh, little-known companies. One is uh, Kodak and one is Instagram. And a few people know about this, uh, but, you know, Kodak actually developed digital camera. And when they did in the uh, early 1990s, uh, they considered it a toy. It was like, you know, based on a, on a traditional photography, you know, their initial digital cameras were like, you know, 0.1 of a pixel or whatever. It was just disaster. It was a toy. So they pretty much tossed it aside and wanted to do nothing with it because they said they're in the, you know, they're in the, photo- they're in the paper business. They're in the paper and film business. And in 2012, Kodak went from being a multi-billion, hundred-some-thousand employees company to filing for bankruptcy and basically being defunct. Uh, meanwhile, within weeks of Kodak announcing that they went broke, Instagram got purchased by, I forget what it is, some billion dollars by Facebook. 
uh, with only 13 employees. And it's because they embraced the digital photography revolution. So I think that, you know, it, it's small companies like this that put out Kodak out of business because they were focused on the wrong thing. And I think what's important for us to remember, it's exactly the same thing. Someone out there is hungrier, has a bigger vision, and is more tuned to the new technologies that are out, that are out there. And if we are not asking ourselves the question, how do we disrupt our industry, rest assured that they are. And if you're not asking yourself that question, rest assured that they will put you out of business sooner or later. Great advice. So what's your vision, Adam, for the next five years? Oh, my gosh. Aside from world domination, <laughs> <laughs> imagine Dr. Evil Mom in here, you know, <laughs> with my pinky next to, my, to the corner of my lips. So, um, you know, I really want to take our company, the marketing mentors, and, and live up to our vision, which is awakening people to the possibilities, to the opportunities through building highly successful businesses. And we're turning it into a, a publishing and, and um, educational empire. So, you know, it's traditionally focused on just very small sliver of a market, the very specific type of people. And we're broadening it up. And we're broadening up, uh, bringing up a lot of different programs that support people, whatever from the, from the idea of wanting to be an entrepreneur, all the way to people who are already making seven and eight figures and, you know, and are looking to uh, grow that even farther. And that's obviously a huge spectrum, a huge you know, different people in different stages require different support. And, you know, so that's my vision is to truly build an, an, an entrepreneurial education company that allows people, regardless of what business they're in and regardless of uh, uh, what stage of building the business they're at, we have what it takes to take them to the next step. And the funny thing is, Patty, that in business, it's like once you build that engine, that engine doesn't really change much. It's just a few tweaks, but how you drive that engine changes constantly depending on what stage you are in your business. That's really what it is. So, you know, the, 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 the vision that I have and, and what we're focusing on a lot is, is not so much uh, revolutionizing the engine, but training better drivers. I can't wait to watch you do that. <laughs> <laughs> well, it started right now, so hey. <laughs> Oh, it passes. I'm at it. You keep your eyes on Adam. So what's the best advice you've ever received? Man, besides all the different things that I've shared with you, another, another best yeah. advice. You know, one advice that I've gotten that I am actually still, it's one of the hardest lessons for me to get. And it's from Ron Legrand. And I've heard him speak once. And he said, look, the less I do, the more I make. And he said, the less you do, the more you'll make. And I went like, you know, I actually was a point of pride with my friends uh, you know, of how hard I could work. And so that advice was just like totally counterintuitive to how I was brought up and my work ethics. But, you know, I, I didn't understand the, the real meaning of advice. And the fact of the matter is that some of the best entrepreneurs, we are workaholics and lazy at the same time. So, you know, hence I often tell people I'm the laziest workaholic you will ever meet. Or, and, and the reason for it is there's time to work hard, but what it means to work less and you, you make more is to realize what is your zone of brilliance and what is your zone of genius and leave everything else to other people. So, you know, like in this conversation, I use metaphors and I use, and, and I use certain words and, and my zone of genius is to come up with, number one, big picture strategies Number two, translate them into actionable small chunks. And number three, come up with a language that's really appealing, that's clear, that's compelling. And then, you know, number four is when people come with their issues is to not only being able to find a unique solution, but also simplify that solution so it's, uh, so it's usable. And that's about all I'm good for. Everything else, I'll pretty much, it's guaranteed if you let me do it, I'll screw it up. But, you know, as entrepreneurs, and often when we are, you know, on a shoestring budget building a business, we think that we can do everything, and then we fall into the trap of thinking we can do everything faster and better than anybody else. I remember in 2003, 2004, I had a student, James Roche, and we did a uh, workshop together. And uh, as we were working on it, you know, we kind of divvied up the work in terms of creating our materials, our handouts. And man, I was so proud. It took me you know, like two hours to create this one-page handout. And we checked in, and I'm like, ah, look what I did. And meanwhile, at the same time, 
he did 10 pages and they were 10 times better than what I did. And I was pissed off. I was like, man, I thought I was like so good at it. But, you know, it also allowed me to see, I'm like, wow, you know, someone else is better at it, a lot better than I am and a lot faster. And he actually enjoyed it. And I really toiled at doing this little handout. So that's the, that's the lesson. The less you do, the more you will make. Find what is your zone of genius and let other people help you with what, what are not your core strengths, what you don't want to be, get better at. And uh, the last word of advice on this is that people often use this as an excuse. They go like, well, I'm just not good at it, so I won't do it. Well, realize that once you are not good at walking and talking, and yet you do it today. So that's not an excuse to not do the things that have to get done. But as soon as you are able, make sure that they're non-critical, non-core activities, and especially the ones that you are absolutely you know, not wired for, that you let someone else support you and you do only what you're really good at. And again, you know, you've heard me, Patty, talk about the fact that you should get paid the most for what comes to you the easiest. Well, what comes to me the easiest is flapping my lips, just like what I'm doing right now. <laughs> and I get paid a fortune for that. And I'm proud of it. Yeah. You're very good <laughs> at it. Well, thank you. <laughs> so what personal growth have you experienced as a result of this entire journey? Oh, boy. You know, this is really an interesting question because. Um, the growth has not stopped yet. You know, I still consider that the best things are still ahead of me. But in, in, you know, my first 10 years in business, when I built my restaurant business, I have experienced so much growth and learned so many things, but I didn't know what they were called. And then, you know, ever since that period, since I got into the uh, self-growth and, and coaching consulting business, I'm, I'm learning definitions of the things that I've learned back then and, and learning to explain them and systemize them and harness them into uh processes that others can follow and use for themselves. But, you know, I think the one lesson that I've learned is, is again, not to give up. That, that failure is really, failure is just an imagination. That I, I teach my clients, forget the, less, forget the losses, but don't lose the lessons. And most people do it in reverse. They forget the lessons, but um, hang on to the losses. And it just really stifles the growth. So if you consider everything that you undertake as just a teaching moment, as an experiment, and disattach yourself from you know what it's going to really produce for you, uh, it's going to just exponentially allow you to grow faster because you will not be afraid of of trip up and and fail. You know, with that, the next lesson is the ability to become really resilient to ridicule, because as entrepreneurs, look here's here's what what. Um, what I understand today, what I think a lot of people don't understand, getting themselves going into business. As human beings, we have one of our basic needs is to be loved and accepted. That is the most fundamental need of a human being. You know, aside from survival, we simply want to be accepted and loved. We are wired to be part of a tribe. Now, as an entrepreneur, you become a maverick and you tip, unless you are in, in a pack of entrepreneurs, which most people originally are not, they have to find that supportive environment. Everyone around you will vote against you and your ideas and ridicule your ideas. And in fact, they will be working extra hard to bring you back to where they are. Why? Because they are afraid that you know, if, if what you are working on will succeed, you're going to leave them behind. So they will be left out. That's their fear. People don't like change. Uh, they will cling to status quo. Now, as entrepreneur, you have this inkling, you have this idea that you can do things better, faster. You can provide you know, better solutions. You can better yourself off. But again, everyone around you tells you that's crazy. You're going to fail. People will laugh at you. Don't do this. You're going to lose your marriage. You're going to lose your house. You, you know, just, you just, you're going to work yourself to death. What are you doing? You're stupid. And, and as entrepreneur, you have to realize that your internal wiring will scream, stop, go back to safety, go back to your, to your tribe. That's, that's, the, that's how you survive. And you have to work and act despite of those voices that kind of go, go back, go back to safety. And it's not an easy thing. And especially if you created some success, then if that voice kicks in again, people will often try to hang on to what they created and are afraid to take risks again. And they end up often losing what they created originally. So it's, it's becoming comfortable with being uncomfortable all the time. And I remember there was something else I was going to share, but I forgot what it was. So we'll stop there. <laughs> okay. Well, that's good. 
being comfortable with discomfort and uncomfortable when you are comfortable. Absolutely. Absolutely. Two lessons that are kind of, it's one lesson, but two different ways to look at it. And it again goes to rewiring ourselves as entrepreneurs. You see, if you seek approval, you will never get ahead because uh, something I learned from one of my mentors, Peter Diamantes, he said, look, uh, what's the dumbest and craziest idea today is a breakthrough tomorrow. So again, if you seek approval, you won't make much progress. So, you know, for myself, I've adopted this thing of risking disapproval and actually flat out seeking disapproval. Because, you know, as, as we wired as, as for, to, to be kind of pack animals, and we've heard this proverbial, proverbial advice that if you see 100 people going in one direction, the way to succeed is go in the opposite direction. Well, it's kind of this thing. It's like when everybody's nodding their heads going like, yeah, 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 what a great idea. Chances are it's too lenient. It's too basic because everybody gets it. Now, when you really seek disapproval, when you bring ideas, so people initially kind of go like, what the hell? I don't get it. Chances are you on the on you on the brinks of of creating a breakthrough, of creating something different, of, of creating exponential growth, but it's uncomfortable as hell. And with that, you know, kind of two other terminologies that I start playing with is number one is reject acceptance. Reject accept, acceptance. When the ideas are accepted, you kind of you you must question it's like they must not be revolutionary enough. And you know, again, there is a thin line in there because if you're too far ahead. Uh, your product, your, your products and services will fail because your market is not quite there. Uh, but be really clear that your success is not necessarily based, especially on personal acceptance from other people. And then the reverse of it is, you know, flat out accept rejection. As an entrepreneur, one of the biggest lessons I think I can share with, with our audience is, look, uh, just accept rejection. Exact, accept the fact that you'll be rejected more than you will be, you will be accepted. And just don't take it personally. That's really it, but but become very comfortable with the fact that you will get a lot of no's and be a lot of and, and get rejected a lot, and it's kind of a vicious cycle because those who can survive the cycle of rejection end up thriving in business, and then everybody wants them. Okay, let's talk about gadgets and gizmos. <laughs> hmm. What tools do you use to make your life easier? You know, a few things. So I think one of my absolutely favorite tools is something called RoboForm, and it's R-O-B-O-F-O-R-M, R-O-B-O-F-O-R-M. And uh, I have it on all my computers, on my iPad, on my iPhone, and, you know, probably everybody today has at least a few dozen different things they uh, they need to log into a day. Anything from social media to uh, sites we purchase from to products we uh, you know, membership sites we sign up for. So I have hundreds of those things. And, you know, so most people have number either one password they use for everything, which isn't very secure, right? Or, you know, they have a spreadsheet or something, or they constantly forget what the heck was the password. So RoboForm stores all of those things for you automatically with just one master password. And uh, again, I've used it. There, there is another software called OnePass, I think, for Mac. But actually, RoboForm works on Mac as well. Again, I, I, I go between Apple and PC. I've got both uh, machines. So that little tool saves me, I don't know, probably a good half an hour a day of fumbling around trying to figure out how to log into something. Yes. You know, go ahead. Yeah, I'm one of those people that just flat out forgets the password and then tries to find it in my Firefox settings and, and spends way too much time. So yep, I'm yep. taking notes. <laughs> and, you know, a beautiful thing is today, we, you know, we, we, very few people actually carry thumb drives. But if you, if you have to work on other people's computers or you travel and just work like in one of those hotel things, you can actually have rubber thumb on, your, on a uh, rubber form on a thumb drive, plug it into the computer, go visit the sites you want to visit. And as you exit, that, that program will actually erase all your traces of being anywhere. So, you know, it's, it's when, especially when you, work, when you work on other people's computers, like in the library or something like this then it's very unsafe to be logging in because others can go back and retrace your steps. So this little thing you know, protects you from, from, from problems like this. Second big gadget, it's uh, an ability to listen to things on high speed. And I just forgot what it's called. Hang on. I need to open my thing. And I know the program is called Speed Player, but I always forgot their manufacturer. 
I've used that with some of your trainings. It's really, it's great. Yep. Yeah, it's by a company called Enounce. E-N-O-U-N-C-E. And if you just type Enounce and then Speed Player, or my Enounce and My Speed, and that's going to take you there. I think that they have a couple of uh, versions and um, something for like 25 bucks or 40 bucks and one for 100 bucks. I think the basic version will do just fine for most people. What it allows you to do is let's say that people listen to this podcast, right? And if they listen on their computer, they actually are able to listen up to three times as fast as normal. Now, what did, what it means for me, for example, when I invest into uh, training programs, audio or video, is that uh, what, what takes other people an hour to consume, I will consume anywhere from 20 to 30 minutes, in 20 to 30 minutes. And then I've got another 30 to 40 minutes to actually start doing something with this information so I can learn and implement twice as fast as other people. And, uh, and today there are a lot of video programs online that don't give you the ability to control. Like you go to a page where you have a sales letter of some sorts and there's a video. Well, you can speed up that video with the Enounce Speed Player. So, you know, again, even though you can't control it, you can't forward and back, but at least you can go through it a lot faster than, than if you were normally. Now, there is a drawback to that. There are actually two drawbacks. Number one is I've listened, I've used it now for years. So apparently I talk a lot faster than normal people talk. And it's because, you know, I can listen fast. <laughs> and when I talk slow, it seems like I talk super slow. <laughs> and the second thing, when you are forced to listen to something at normal speed, so like on a CD in a car, it's just, uh, I got to tell you, people seem at least twice, at least half as smart as before. I don't know what that is, but when we talk, when we listen to something on a fast speed, it's a lot more engaging. And when we listen at normal speed, all of a sudden it's like boring. It's like, oh my gosh, somebody speed it up. <laughs> so you'll be addicted to consuming information on high speed, but it's a great little tool. I'll put that in the show notes for those of you listening. It'll be pattykeating.com forward slash Adam Urbanski. And we'll get some links for you so you can check out his great tools and and try them out. Okay, so what about a book, a podcast, or a blog that you would recommend? Podcast or blog? You know, I don't listen to much pod, too many podcasts. Um, I'm trying to think. There's something I found recently. You know, I know there's a, there's a guy now uh, out there, Michael Hyatt. Yes. And uh, so I pay attention to him occasionally. But in terms of the book, there's a book that I read last year that really has impacted me, and especially that I talked about selling earlier. I think that I'll share that with you. It's called The Secret of Selling Anything. The Secret of Selling Anything, and it's by Harry Brown. If you are finding yourself challenged with, uh, with really being effective at selling, and by you, I mean our listeners, that book will transform the way you look at selling and give you some really, really good tools. And for the price of the book, I think this is one of the best books, one of the, the best trainings on sales uh, that can be gotten anywhere. And again, it's just for the price of a book. That's great. We'll get those on the show notes as well. Okay, Adam. So this is the looking back question. If you were to do this all over again, what would you tell your younger self? I'll probably say fail faster. <laughs> I'll probably say I'll fail faster. You know, I think for the longest time, uh, it, it, it took a while to develop the muscle that's like, you know what, I don't care what people think. I'm just going to do what I want to do or do what needs to be done and see what happens. And again, fail is a relative term. So learning that just putting, putting things into action and looking for the lessons and, and tweaking and so on, that's really it. Uh, I think the second big lesson I'll give myself that, you know what, um, struggle is optional. So what I mean by that is... People confuse effort with struggle. I put a lot of effort into a lot of things that I do. Um, and again, I, I often share with, my, uh, with people that ask me questions just like you. You know, I'm not the smartest tool in the shed. I don't consider myself to be you know, particularly gifted in, in, in any uh, specific area. But I will outgrind everybody else, meaning I, I'll work longer and harder uh, because I just won't give up. I'm like a dog with a bone. It's like once I've got my teeth in it, I won't let go. So, but effort does not mean struggle. Struggle is the way you view it things. If you look at things, it's a matter of perception. So find a way to find joy in everything you do. And when you do that, 
uh, life is going to be a tremendous, you know, a lot easier, a lot easier. And I think the last, the third thing is, uh, it's something I learned from Jim Rohn, you know, which is when, don't, don't wish for things to be easier, wish for you to be better. And, you know, often I think people will, as humans, again, it's, it's so natural to just look for scapegoats, like the economy, the government, you know, the clients, this, the bank. You know, don't, don't blame things outside of you. Instead, think about how can you be better? What, what can you change? How can you be different to get a different result? Because, you know, if you, if, you be, if, you be, if you keep getting the same result over and over and over and over, it has nothing to do with the outside world. It has to do with who you have become. And you've got to become someone different to, uh, be, to get a different result. Good advice. Thank you so much, Adam. I appreciate you sharing your, your golden nuggets and wisdom with us today. Well, once again, thank you for having me. And I, uh, I wish you and your show best of success in impacting so many people. It's fantastic that you are doing this. Thank you, Adam. I hope you enjoyed this week's episode of the Entrepreneur Unleashed Show. If you did, please go to pattykeating.com and let me know what you're up to this year in your business. While you're there, be sure to grab your copy of Five Quick Ways to Share Your Expertise. <laughs> 